Welcome everyone here today. Um, welcome to the Iowa Ideas In-Depth Week. And the topic of this In-Depth Week is advancing Iowa's communities. And obviously that's really broad, but uh, we have five days of noon forums that kind of get at this topic and how we can advance our communities. Um, so with the largest share of working parents here in Iowa of any state in the country, we obviously need affordable quality childcare but 23% of Iowans live in parts of the state without adequate childcare openings. Today, we're gonna to talk about what's next in childcare because obviously to advance the mother of three children and I remember when they were little how challenging it was to, to find spots for them in childcare and after school programs. I'd like to ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce herself and explain um, their connection to the topic of childcare. Um, let's start off with Miranda. Hi, I'm Miranda Nemi. I am currently the executive director at the Collins Aerospace Day Academy here in Cedar Rapids. I also co-own the Business Quality Beginnings that manages the Child Care Center for Collins. Great, Diana? Hi, I'm Diana Williams. I'm the director of the Ann W. Wickman Child Development Center in Atlantic, Iowa. We've been here for 12 years, and we are managed and operated by the Nishna Valley Family YMCA here in town. And we have birth to age five in our building. Okay, and uh, Tracy? Hello, everyone. Tracy Ellert. I am a um, state legislator on the west side of Cedar Rapids. I'm also an early childhood educator. Um, I work in the Cedar Rapids Community School District and also run a small business that um, does continuing education for um, the, early child, the early childhood workforce. And Janae. Good afternoon. My name is Janae Harvey, and I'm the Division Administrator over Adult Children and Family Services here at DHS. Some of my um, responsibilities include um, the oversight of the Child Care Bureau, and I got to be um, heavily involved in the, in the Governor's uh, Child Care Task Force over this past year. That's great. We're going to dig into that um, right away here. I just wanted to let our viewers know that Representative Ellert is in Des Moines at the State House and may have to pop off to be part of um, a floor debate there in the House. Um, so if you see her disappear, she'll come back if she can. All right, so let's kind of um, get started. Um, as Janae was talking about, Governor Kim Reynolds formed a task force to consider the challenges facing Iowa's child care system. That task force on which, you know, several people on the screen here served in one capacity or another, issued a report in November and it included recommendations on many fronts, um, but, but eight of those were for businesses. It seemed like that was the largest category. Um, Miranda, I was hoping as director of the Collins Aerospace Day Academy and a member of the task force, could you kind of highlight a couple of those business recommendations that you think would be most helpful to companies? Um, I know the, the couple of the recommendations were um, some tax cuts or um, tax abilities. I'm not sure um, what a couple of the other ones were. I was focusing on a lot of the other ones that directed more of my day-to-day -day work because I'm already partnered with the business um, at that point. Um, I know business partnerships is very important. It is a really good option to help the child care crisis. Um, so I know that they're looking at um, some tax incentives and things for businesses to be able to um, to um, invest in child care programs in a variety of different ways, as I know one of the solutions that they had. Well, feel free other panelists to jump in on those business recommendations. Some of the business recommendations, I think, and I was on the task force too with Miranda, was combining uh, getting communities involved with businesses and uh, letting them know about the need for child care in their communities and letting them know what the benefits are to those businesses to be able to collaborate with the child care, not only the home providers, but the centers and also the school district so that they could all work together to build their community stronger. Yeah, I would wanna at least um, mention, Erin, that um, one of the activities going on right now um, involves um, IEDA and their work with the Iowa Women's Foundation and really trying to figure out how do we um, get the attention of the private sector 
And I think it's it's great that Miranda is on this panel because um, she represents a sector that we are really looking to for examples, prototypes of how can um, private businesses really get leaning into this conversation around childcare. Um, obviously, the, the spotlight really came on childcare in a number of ways when COVID hit. We started going, wow, childcare isn't just isn't just a nice thing for parents to have. Childcare is part of the backbone of our economy. When we do not have childcare, we don't have a workforce, right? So those key emergency medical personnel, they don't show up at their hospital shift if they have little ones at home and their childcare is closed. Um, we, it, any sector you go to right now, you're gonna hear about workforce challenges. So we, we really wanna um, shake, shake or um, work on some of those stagnant issues as they pertain to childcare and get our private sector to bring some of their innovative um, business thinking into this space. Um, I think it would be an appropriate time for me to mention that there, there are going to be some new um, grants programs um, that will be announced um, in short order with the governor's support uh, that will be targeted at the private sector for, for them to come up with other innovative ideas. And we really want to spark that curiosity and, and those commitments, because these are not um, problems that on the public sector alone that we are going to fix. So I'm really excited to see where some of those partnerships um, emerge as well. That's great. And since you mentioned, um, you know, I just wondered, Miranda, would you mind sharing a little bit about what you offer there at Collins Aerospace? Uh, yes, we are. Um, we have a 22 classrooms in our building. Um, we are the largest child care center in the state of Iowa with my, the number of children we're licensed for under one roof, um, basically. So we have the largest building. So I have 22 classrooms in our building. We have, um, like Diana, we serve six weeks up to, um, we do before and after school care as well through fifth grade. We do have transportation from two of the local school districts that do bus their kids back and forth um, for us um, from designated schools based on mileage. Um, so we do that and then also have a summer camp program for our school age kids. So we have right now 302 children in our building and about 66 staff. Um, so those are the kind of things that we offer for our families. We are primarily here for Collins employees um, because Collins Aerospace does subsidize us. We are here for them. However, we do take children from the community if we have space available to make sure that we are helping out um, the community as well. If we have spaces available, we will take in the kiddos um, to help others as well. So we have a few families in here that are non-Collins, um, about 90% are have one parent, if not two parents or a grandparent working at Collins. Great, and for people who are listening, um, not from Eastern Iowa, that's in Cedar Rapids. So, you know, one of our larger communities in the state. And while we have Representative Ellert here, I wanna make sure to just get in a, a, a question that I thought might be, that she might be able to help us with. Um, one of the recommendations was about shared services um, in the, um, you know, childcare environment. I was hoping you could talk with us a little bit about that. I, I know you're an early childhood educator and a business owner. How would that, how would this model be used and how is it valuable? So I do sit on, I can't think of our official title, but the shared services um, committee. We've met twice only so far. There will be six meetings, um, one a month for the next six months. Um, we've had the first two. The first one was mostly just introducing all the committee members and talking about what shared services is. Um, so there was not a lot of action items on that meeting. The second one, we started digging more about what um, the shared services will be offered. And shared services, I've seen you know models around in different states. They can really be small to really grand um, grand projects. And in Iowa so far on the committee, we are do talking a lot around um, automating services, getting um, programs, especially homes on automated services that collect their fees from the parents and taking out some of the paperwork. Um, they did some pre-surveying to find out, you know, what were some of the highest needs in programs. Um, and it was payments and time. And, you know, especially in those home settings, they're spending so much extra time after their work hours, caring for the kids, doing the paperwork and tracking things. 
So the shared services will help on that. Um, we have, I don't really want to speak too much more on that because I'm not sure what else I can share yet since we haven't went into um, the other meetings to discuss the other areas, but it'll be more than that. But that's the main topic right now is automating services. And Diana, from, from your perspective at your center there in Atlantic, what would it be like if you could share some of those services? I'm, I'm actually on that committee with Tracy and, and I agree that it would help a lot of the home providers as well as the centers to, when they enter information into their, um, into their computers or into their system, it would help to go to several different places, Child and Adult Care Food Program, um, Department of Human Services, uh, QRS or Iowa QRS that they're going into, if when they're entering information, it would help to go to several of these places to eliminate some of that paperwork and some of that time consumption that it's, it's so hard for, uh, for childcare workers, whether in a center or at home, there's not enough hours in the day to get everything done. And especially the home providers when they're in their home environment, they're spending a lot of hours after work trying to get that paperwork done. And the same with centers too, that takes a lot of their time. So I think the shared services program, like, like Tracy said, it's just really new. It's just coming up and we're just getting started. But I think there's going to be a lot of wonderful things that are going to come from that. In our center, uh, as I said, and I was on the child care task force with Miranda too, and we had four focus groups that we were involved in. And it was increasing employee investment was one of them. Uh, regulatory barriers and financing options was the second. Expanding eligibility for child care assistance was the third one. And then the one that I was on was child care workforce issues. So those were the four areas that we really focused on. And I know that the shared services program was one of the things that Governor Reynolds wanted to put into place immediately. And so I'm really happy to see that that started. Another thing that they put into effect immediately was the um, retention and recruitment, uh, the funding that came down from DHS. And I know that's been very, very helpful. Um, for the not only home providers, but for center providers to be able to put some extra money into those providers' pockets to help them to earn a livable wage, you know, so that they could be able to uh, remain in childcare. That's what we're trying to do is we're trying to recruit people to stay in there and professionalize the profession. They're working such long hours. They put so much into it. We want to help them so that they can continue to stay in childcare and afford to be able to do that. So in our building, uh, we are licensed for 101 children and we, on an average, we have between 85 and 98 kids a day that are in our building. So we've almost maxed out our potential and that's with uh, utilizing one of the empty classrooms that's down at our YMCA about a block and a half away. And we took our four and five-year-olds from our building and took them and transferred them down there, used some of the DHS funding rejuvenated one of the empty rooms that was down there and made it our four and five-year-old classroom, which opened up a whole room at our center to be able to take on more kids. Um, we're connected to an old elementary school that the school system is utilizing for some of their special needs classrooms. And we have our infant room over in, that in one of those classrooms. So we're trying to expand every way that we possibly can. But I know at one time we had 70 kids on our waiting list and trying to get those kids into the building, trying to get staff in here so that we would be able to watch those children, find spaces that we could go ahead and utilize. It's, it's all such a big challenge. Wow. You're getting at a lot of topic potential questions there. Um, I wanted to ask um, a little bit kind of about the portability. I understand that's one of the issues um, that, that uh, childcare providers want to have portability of their certification, their different training classes they take. So, you know, tell me about what's available now and maybe what you'd like to see. And you, anyone can chime in on this. Um, I can answer that one. Um, right now, um, per uh, DHS, all of our employees have to have the Iowa Criminal and Child Abuse Registry check, background checks done um, before they start employment, um, just to make sure that we're hiring um, people that should be around children. And then we also have to do um, a federal background check to check for any criminal history outside of Iowa to make sure they didn't move in or the bordering states because we have um, a lot of uh, cities you can live in Illinois and work in Iowa. Same thing on the other side with Nebraska. And so um, right now, those um, background checks belong to the center or the program. And 
Um, so for example, if I decided that I wanted to go and work in Diana's center, um, I would have to get reprinted and re-background checked again. Um, I wouldn't be able to take my background checks with me and say, hey, I just got checked six months ago. Everything's clear. I would have to get rechecked again. Um, so it can be very costly for programs if um, they just got done doing one uh, on an employee, they leave and they go to another center. So now they're getting checked twice. Um, ideally, it would be nice if they belong to that person so that would go with them. So then it would help cut some of that cost out for us that that person would be responsible for their background checks and fingerprints. Um, so one of the questions that center has been coming up and this has been kind of a question in Lynn County at least is we like to put together a sub pool just like the school districts have. They have a place that they can call to get a substitute teacher. Well, with the background checks and fingerprints, it's kind of limiting us being able to share staff amongst centers. Um, so that way, if you know, Susie decided that she wanted to be a sub for a center, didn't mind bouncing from program to program or even in homes as well. She would have to be fingerprinted and background checked at every single place that she worked. Um, so ideally it, to save time and money and to be able to help some of our programs, it'd be nice if the background checks and things were able to be held in one place so that it can just be looked at or if the person was responsible for it or something else along that line. So that way we could um, share staff a little bit easier. Um, so that way we could have a sub pool. Um, so trying to figure out how we can best utilize um, some of the this great staff and people that just want to work wherever <laughs> kind of thing as well. So I'm going to jump in because this was actually one of my first things I tried to tackle when I came into the legislature. And I worked with Ryan Page, who I see on the screen here, and we tried to figure out a way around this. Um, there are some stipulations. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Um, there are some stipulations which make it a little hard um, with, like Miranda said, that center owns that information. Um, but I did have a conversation with Representative Ann Meyer, who works on, is the chair of the Human um, Resources uh, Committee here in the House, and we're looking for what can we do? And this is something that she really wants to work on. Uh, we don't know if there is a fix based on our previous conversations, but it's definitely been in the talks for, uh, even before I came in, that's how I came in with idea is, I actually used to use some of Miranda's employees in my in-home childcare and the fact that they could be approved to work in her program, but then had to get reapproved and I had to wait months to get them approved. Um, I think this could be a fix to some of our staff shortages, especially programs that maybe want to be open second or third shift. If they could share people that are already um, already approved, this could be really helpful. Um, I to kind of answer part of the question beyond just the background stuff. Uh, DHS also has the iPower system, which holds all our cert training certificates and everything too. Um, so that's a way that that information is gathered and shared as well. I want to I want to just jump in here um, and Representative Ellert, thank you so much for um, your engagement in all of this work, the work that you've done with Ryan. And she speaks to this that our laws in Iowa and some of the federal requirements as well are really really complicated to untangle. Who owns that right to a background check? And there are legal provisions that that are kind of entrenched in Iowa law that that it's. Um, I think it's a great North Star and one that DHS is fully supporting this idea that staff, if you're if you're good to work, you should be able to work in a number of child care situations, especially those um, home based providers who literally never get a break. They do not get to leave their homes, um, essentially, if they're offering in home child care. Right. So what happens when they're sick? Um, all the parents who use that in home provider have no place to take their kids. Um, that's a terrible flaw in our system. So we are, um, there is no quick fix here, but this is one that we are taking some of our smartest and most committed people um, into kind of what we call the room to walk through what would it take to fix this problem? How do we build up legislative support? If there are resources that are needed on the DHS end, um, is that something that legislators would be open to? because we do think that there is a more efficient and effective way to do this part of the work in Iowa, but it's, it's not a quick amendment to a bill. There, there's a number of places that we have to 
to walk this through in order to be in compliance with the law. But that is something that's underway with with even yep. within this session. Um, probably, I don't think this session because the work is just too complicated, but we have the right people working on it and putting together what we call basically a concept paper or a white paper that would map out all the different areas that would need to be fixed. And if there is a fiscal impact to those changes, um, what is the price tag on that fix? But uh, we are very much aligned and very much aware how this is creating an unnecessary barrier to a number of our child care providers. Okay, that's great. I'm, it'll be exciting to you know, maybe talk about this in a year and see where that conversation point is. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the other recommendations says the state should re-examine child staff ratios and other staffing restrictions. Um, Janae, what are the ratios now for a center versus an in-home provider? And you know, I, I think that there are some changes afoot with different laws, um, you know, different bills that have been proposed. I don't know if you want to take the first hit on that uh, question. Oh, I'm, I'm going to try and do good work here. Um, so out of the child care task force, um, some of the recommendations that were really cross cutting were, was the ask for DHS to take a hard look at any type of regulatory barrier that makes it hard to do child care work in the state. Child care is obviously a human capital intensive um, business model. 60 to 80% of the cost for any one of our child care providers is um, tied up in personnel costs. So um, some legislators um, really zeroed in on, hey, if you can alter some of those ratios with staff, maybe you can get more working parents into the workforce. Um, it, the ratios um, are really mostly dictated according to the age of the children. Um, and so one of the bills that, that is passed uh, uh, some part of the legislative body, but it's, um, we're not sure what's gonna happen on, on the other side of the house or of the legislative body, I should say more appropriately, um, is looking at altering the ratios of one staff member to six two-year-olds up to seven two-year-olds. And the other part of the bill would increase um, the ratio from one staff, I believe it's up to 10 three-year-olds if I'm remembering correctly. Um, on the DHS side, we're not sure what's going to happen right now because this is a policy decision um, really and legislators are having some pretty interesting or heated conversations with each other maybe. And this is a space that maybe um, Representative Ellert um, maybe wants to share her thoughts. Sure, thanks, today. <laughs> um, so yeah, we did not take that bill up in the House when we um, took up the other two child care bills. Over in the Senate, they um, turned that bill into an amendment and attached it to one of the um, current child care bills. So we may see that pass back over to the House. Um, my concern with it is I know that eventually the ratios will need to be looked at it. They were just updated for child development homes. I just don't think right now is the time. Our child care workforce is so overworked and so stressed right now with COVID. In some parts of the state, you had the duration like we had in Lynn County. It just is not the time to add this extra burden onto those childcare professionals. Um, and it's not gonna be them that gets to make that decision. It'll be you know the person that owns the center that gets to decide if now those two and three year, um, year old classroom teachers are gonna have to take extra children. And how is that you know equitable to the rest of the staff who doesn't have to take extra? Um, so there's just a lot of concerns. I just don't think right now with all the stress around childcare and everybody being so overworked is the time to increase them. Um, um, but I do see why it's being looked at because it could potentially get a couple more kids into programs. From what I'm hearing all across the state when I talk to providers, though I have come across one program personally, I'm sure there's more that exists out there, but just one personally that is actually planning on implementing it if it goes through, but just at like drop off and pick up times. Um, for the most part, every other program I've talked to said, we're not doing that to our staff. So I don't know that it'll really be utilized if it, even if it does go through. And if to uh, address what Tracy just said, I'm in agreement with that. We've already got overworked staff that are working 40 plus hours. And especially when you have a shortage of staff and they have to maintain those classrooms and we're already stressing them out 
tremendously. And we're trying to do everything we can to keep those people in our buildings and in our childcare homes. And we need to find a way to somehow increase, increase the help for those staff. And the retention and recruitment bonus that just came through is a wonderful, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. We need to find additional ways for the staff to be able to take some of the burden off of them and to encourage people to come into this career and stay in this career. Um, in our personal building, we do not, we are not able to offer benefits. We have some benefits that we do offer our staff that have been here for over, over six months. Um, they do get uh, uh, half price child care. So they're paying $2 an hour for child care. And they also get a YMCA membership, but we're looking at providing benefits for those staff. How can we do that? After they've been here for a while, they get two vacation days and they get two holidays, but we want to be able to provide those extra benefits so that they can, some of these women are, they're the breadwinners in their families. And so if they can't continue to work in our building because they need those benefits, then they go to other places to work. And one other thing I wanted to mention real quick, because I think I'm going to, it sounds like debate starting and I'll have to jump off, but the parent side also, when I ran a childcare program for 14 years, the top three questions I was always asked was, where are you located? What is your weekly rate? And what are your staff child ratios? Parents are really concerned about that. And this would also not be a choice for them, for families that currently have their children enrolled it'll be the center director's decision if they want to increase or not. Now, parents that are out there looking for care, you know, would obviously have the choice, but you can't just say we're going to increase them and you have to be okay with it or find another place because there's no other place for them to find right now. And that's not good for the child either. You want to have that continuity of care um, at those young age groups. And so, yes, I think here debate. So if you see me disappear, I might be back on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, and I like to piggyback off of what they've been saying as well. Um, that has been a big concern floating around my building as well. My staff, we have four two-year-old classrooms and three three-year-old classrooms. So it affects seven of my classrooms. I've already told my staff not to worry about it, that we would not be increasing our ratios if it did go through. Um, I taught in the three-year-old class classroom full-time from August to December, and I had 16 um, three-year-olds in the classroom. I was great. I was very grateful. I had a great class, um, but I did have one special needs child in that class. And there's two of us. We are one to eight. And I cannot imagine having four more kids in that classroom, knowing that I had that child that needed a little bit more one-on-one -on -one care as well. And still trying to manage all the help, self-help skills that those two and three-year-olds need, because you're looking at potty training and getting along with others, um, being able to share and building those relationships with those children. So I think programs really need to be able to look at the quality of the programming that you are providing because these parents are paying a lot of money for childcare. Um, childcare rates and tuition rates keep going up. And so they really, these kids and these families deserve a quality program as well. And so I think we really need to look at that too when we're increasing child adult ratios. The pandemic has caused a lot of stress on workers, but it has caused a lot of stress and, um, stress for families as well. And so we're seeing a lot more children with behavioral issues and some um, delays as well because of the pandemic. So we have a lot more on our plates dealing with a lot more social emotional needs than we have in the past as well. So um, I think we do really need to look at the well-being of the workforce, but then also the quality programming that we're able to provide those children and uh, children and families as well. Now, were you in the classroom during that time period? Were you like filling in for someone on maternity leave or how, how did that happen? <laughs> Um, so in August of 2021, um, it seemed like that's when the staffing crisis hit. I think we've always had a little bit of a staffing issue or being able to find quality employees. It seems like this fall is when it really hit hard. We lost 12 employees within three weeks. Um, they resigned. And um, I don't have a whole lot of turnover here. Um, we did this last year. Um, 11 of those 12 left the early childhood field completely. They left um, to go work somewhere else for more money um, to be able to pay their bills. They were um, single moms, um, the breadwinners, as Diana said. So um, they needed something that was going to pay more, that they were going to be able to um, be able to pay their bills and things. So they left. And um, so I had one person that went to another center and trying to find quality staff 
we couldn't find them. So I was in a preschool classroom from the middle of August <laughs> until um, January 1st, we came back from winter break, um, teaching 50 hours a week, um, my 16 lovely three-year-olds until I could find staff. Wow. Well, that That's gets at an important question. I was just going to say, um, you know, it's kind of the conundrum of childcare. As a parent, you feel like you're paying a significant portion of your salary toward childcare, but the childcare providers are not getting rich off these these jobs. It's not like there's, you know, someone, some middleman, you know, keeping all the money. It's, uh, you know, are there, how do we increase wages for childcare workers without making it too expensive for families? And is there any need for the government to subsidize that? Um, I've been doing a lot of advocacy um, for Iowa Association for the Education of Young Children as well. And one of our big things is we need sustainable funding. The stabilization grant um, that just came um, that came out a couple months ago, uh, COVID relief dollars. Um, we were getting stipends for a while. The um, retention and recruitment bonus that Diana's talked about, those have been fabulous. They've been great to help us get through and be able to some of us to keep our doors open. We just need that sustainable funding that we can count on so we can raise um, raise the uh, tuition or be able to raise wages and offer benefits. I'm fortunate enough, my staff all receive benefits, but I'm large enough that I have to be, I have to um, provide medical insurance. I'm also very fortunate because I have Collins that subsidizes me. So we're able to, I wait, we raised, raised our wages in December. Um, and so I was able to get people in here because now I'm able to compete with the quick stars, the Starbucks, the targets, um, and those again. And so I'm very fortunate, but I'm kind of that odd one that I have company backing. So I'm able to do some of those things, but we really need, and myself included, because Collins isn't like an empty barrel of money that I can just keep tapping into all the time and all the other programs, homes and um, rural areas. And as well, we all need that sustainable funding that we can count on so we can raise these wages up so we can have a competitive way, offer benefits and treat these people in the early childhood as professionals as they are. I agree with, I agree with what Miranda said. I'm sorry, Erin. Um, we live in more of a rural community. And so a lot of our providers, our home providers, when we first opened our building in 2010, we had 39 home providers that were in our community. We're down to less than 16 now. And every one of those providers is full. They don't have any more openings. Uh, so when we have families that call us, we put them on a waiting list. And like I said, we've expanded one of our classrooms down at the Y. We're trying to find additional ways that we can go ahead and increase. But having our, our staff makes less than what someone coming into McDonald's or someone that's working at Target, like what Miranda said. Um, and, and we don't have the benefits that we're able to offer yet. We're working on that. So we're trying to find ways to increase. I just lost another employee today like Miranda said, who has gone to a higher paying job that has benefits. And I don't blame them at all. You know, I, I understand that they need to do that, but that hurts our consistency of care, like Erin said. And when you have the parents that are relying on care during the pandemic was such a horrible time. We, we stayed open during the whole pandemic. Um, our numbers went down to 30 kids for a while, but we were able to stay open. We did have to quarantine two individual classrooms but we also met with our police department and our hospital to find out we have a lot of hospital employees, children in our building. And so we needed to be able to stay home or stay open so that those employees could work. And during what Janae said, during the pandemic, it really came to light how important childcare was to keep your community operating. And to some of these more rural communities than what we are, that are losing childcare providers and families are trying to drive, they're having to drive to other communities to find childcare. And some of them are moving to other communities. Those smaller communities are drying up. So this is, this is dire that we work on this immediately. Find a way to help increase the funding that comes to some of these providers so that they can continue to stay working with children. So Erin, I need to add to that, um, that there's kind of three common goals that I think we're consistently committed to in childcare. We want quality, we want affordability, and we want it to be accessible, right? Those three pieces are what make up really the components of a good childcare infrastructure. Um, and I think that there has been appropriately so some, some uh, significant public criticism 
um, around thinking that childcare can fully survive in a free market environment. If it, if it is the people who get childcare, are the ones who can pay the most, um, that, that's going to be problematic, right? There's really been more of a shift in thinking around is child care, should it be driven by free market um, forces? Or maybe there's a way that we think of it as essential infrastructure, a common good, something that people need accessible, just like um, health care, right? Like our hospitals, we don't treat hospitals in a free market environment either, right? Um, so there has been both significant financial investment in childcare, and Diana has mentioned this a couple of times. We are in the middle of a $30 million investment in workforce. So those are $1,000 recruitment and retention bonuses to anybody um, who has worked in childcare for at least six months. As long as we have money, we're gonna keep on giving out that money. So far, we've already been able to give out about $10 million. But another area that I do wanna draw attention to, and it is really um, squarely in the conversation around shared services, shared services is around finding efficiency. And efficiency is another way of increasing your bottom line without new resources, right? So. I wanna be real, like illustrate this very specifically um, for this audience at large. Shared services um, will include a very big statewide investment around something called child care management system, that's CCMS. Um, right now, the people who are in child care, the way they answer their why question is they love working with kids. They do not love balancing their books. And yet we know through this survey that Diana and Representative Ellert um, referenced, we surveyed all of our child care centers and all of our child development homes to ask them about their business practices. 77% get payments either late and a notable percentage of them never get any payment at all. They are never able to collect that, those costs that is a loss. That is money that needs to be going back into childcare. So, so when we ask them, how do you collect payment? A large percentage collect cash. Some collect checks. Very few have moved to some of what we would call more modern platforms of accepting payment like Venmo, PayPal. CCMS um, will have payment functionality that we are going to be bringing into the state that allows for the efficiency around the collection of money. So when a parent comes in, let me just say an example of how this could work. A parent brings their kid into a childcare center. There's a kiosk where the parent maybe signs in their kid quickly. That information goes into the attendance records. That child is on a childcare assistance subsidy. That interfaces with DHS's system. That payment is automatic out to that childcare center, as opposed to all of the paperwork labor that our child care providers are entrenched in doing. Uh, the, the, the feeding programs, we have heard over and over from our child care centers, how labor intensive filling out all the paperwork around the types of food, the meals, the quantities, all of that that is tied into how much they get compensated for. So we are taking really a, a holistic look at where are the places that becoming more modern and where can DHS or the state pick up the cost of becoming more efficient to make life easier for all of these um, business owners. And I need to give the more eloquent name for um, what Diana and Representative Ellard are doing. They're on a co-design team. It is not a committee. They are really designing how this work will look in Iowa. And we're really appreciative to them because they're giving um, amazing feedback to the direction we are going in the future. I wanna um, you know, follow up on that. We have a question from one of our audience members asking if um, you know, shared services, and maybe this would be like the CCMS that you're talking about, whether it would be connected to free and reduced lunch programs at schools. So if you've got parents who are entering information about children there, could it cross over to different platform? I mean, if you're talking about like efficiencies and getting kids kind of registered for those services. Yeah, so what I would say is I do not know um, all the limitations of what might be possible, but ideas like that are great ideas that should be considered, 
that's what I will say. We will ultimately be in a situation where we are going to have to competitively procure which um, information management system we do use. So that'll be forthcoming in this, up, in this upcoming year. And the ability to interface with other data systems like the free and reduced lunch program over at DE, I don't know if that is possible, but that is a great example of what we are trying to accomplish in the state. If the state already has X information, we, all, we don't need you to give it to us again in the version in a form of Y. We already have that information one place. Let's figure out how the state can help support some of the efficiencies that our child care providers need us to do the work. That's great. So you're saying that CCMS may be online in the next year or so, or? Well, the, the, the procurement will be taking place this year. Um, I'm sure it will be a phased in approach because CCMS is, a, is like a huge project, right? With lots of different um, uh, kind of what we'd call tentacles, like all the different functionality would roll out probably in different phases. Um, so in the next year, we will definitely not be done, but we will make a lot of progress in the upcoming year. And we will continue to stay engaged with our actual childcare business owners, like some that are on the panel today. And we will prioritize the functionality according to what we are hearing in the co-design team. That's the plan. That's great. Well, I want to get at here, we've got about 20 minutes left, um, the Child Care Challenge, um, which is a program that was launched in November with $10 million. Um, it got another $37 million in January to create 5,200 5, new child care slots in 72 communities around the state. It looks to me like many of the grants were, will fund like building expansions to create physical space for these children, um, but and that's great, but I wonder how this fits in with the conversation about hiring enough staff for those openings. That's how we, we use the Child Care Challenge funding to go ahead and uh, create the room that we then moved our four-year-olds down to, but you brought up a very good point. When we did that, we took some of our existing staff down there, so the reason we're needing additional staff now not only to replace, like Miranda said, we a lot of our staff have stayed for several years. We haven't really had a problem up until this last two years when the pandemic hit and we, we lost some of our staffing too because some of our ladies were older and they were to a point that uh, with the pandemic, they were at jeopardy. And so they just went ahead and decided that they, this wasn't worth them risking their lives and, and doing this anymore. And so we did lose some employees. But as far as staffing, we do need something that helps with the staffing. Uh, the Child Care Challenge was great. It was wonderful to be able to create that space for us. Um, and DHS is working diligently on finding ways to provide income for personnel. But that's what we need is something that goes directly to the people to create staff so that when you have these new buildings, you also have staff, trained staff that you can place into them and you can go ahead and keep that consistency of care. I think with that child care challenge and Diana, a perfect example, um, right when that was starting to come out is when my staffing kind of went south on me because we are looking at expanding in a classroom or two in our building. And at that point, we slammed the brakes on hard because I kept losing staff and I was afraid that even if I had the money and the funds to be able to expand, I wouldn't be able to staff it. So we hit the brakes and stopped. Um, we will, if all goes well, be expanding out one more classroom in August this year um, because we have the space available and I'm getting um, a lot more, it's been a little bit easier now that I've increased wages to get staff in. So I'm not so worried about the staffing part of it, but that child care challenge for that is the first thing I kind of thought of. I'm like, do we do it or not? And I was afraid that we would get the money to be able to expand. And then I wouldn't be able to actually do anything with the expansion because I wouldn't have the staff for the kids that I already had enrolled, let alone trying to get more kids in. The, one of the things that was on the governor's task force that Miranda and I talked about and Janae even too, was to help staff the teach and wages program was brought up and increasing funding into both of those. And for those of you that aren't familiar, TEACH is a program that enables staff to go ahead and take college classes. It reimburses a portion of their college classes as well as the business. They also contribute a portion of those college classes too. 
it's wonderful for people to go ahead and increase their, their education and receive their CDAs, their child development associates, and then also take college classes so that they have their associate's degrees or they have their bachelor's degrees. Uh, wages is a program that compensates your staff that already have those bachelor's degrees or have those associate degrees and reimburses them uh, a, a portion of that money they receive uh, every six months. Part of the problem with the wages program, and it's not that it's a problem, but when you already have overworked staff that are working 40 hours a week, it's really hard to encourage them to then take college classes at night so that they can get that CDA and get that associate's degree. So it's, it's kind of a tender balance to try and find a way to, it's, it's wonderful to have these programs. It's wonderful to offer, offer those opportunities to increase their profession, um, but it's a really tight rope that you walk to be able to offer that to your staff that are already overworked. Yeah, I do want to just um, echo the effectiveness of the Teach and Wages program. Um, it typically in the field of child care, we know that there's on average a 30% turnover. So that's a pretty, very high amount of staff kind of continually churning. And yet we know that the recipients of the Teach and Wages program, um, the wages recipient, the turnover was um, at only 4% last year. So um, it's significantly effective and it raises the wages, which is uh, lots of people, they're doing um, child care work because it's their passion, but sometimes the, the low wages get in the way. They just say, I cannot do this. So the Teach and Wages program, um, DHS, we, we've invested $17 million in that program to take us through 2024. Um, I do not know in the state what will happen at that point. That's obviously a legislative um, question and answer. Um, but we did want to prioritize the recruitment and retention bonuses, the teach and wages were the most obvious ways that we thought that we could be involved in um, supporting the workforce. And it was nice, like Janae said, the teach and wages because it's housed in the Iowa Association for the Education of Young Children's Office. And as our governing, pre governing board president, we talk about the teaching wages quite a bit. And we did have the wages program in Iowa before um, DHS gave the money and we had it only a certain amount of um, counties that could get funding. And so now with that extra money, it was nice to be able to go statewide because I know that was one of our goals is to get wages statewide so everybody could benefit from the program as well. So we're kind of hoping that we can get it through legislature after 2024 to keep it going statewide. But ultimately we would like to see wages um, workforce wages go up enough that we may not need a wages program in the future. So that's kind of the goal is to not need it that all of the early child um, care professionals, whether it's home providers or um, center providers, are making a competitive wage that um, it's no longer needed. But when, as long as it is, we will try to get as much funding as we can to keep it going because it is a great program for everybody involved. Now, one question um, from an audience member, and this is something I hadn't heard about, um, but uh, they asked whether you would foresee any financial support for programs run by nonprofits or volunteer efforts. So I'm going to jump in here and just flag for people. I mentioned it at the very beginning, and it's going to be coming out of IWD. So don't no, no need to follow up with me. It will Iowa be Workforce happening. Development. Iowa Workforce Development. It will come out on um, their website or the way they communicate. There will be a near future funding opportunity for businesses. You do not have to be uh, for profit. So it would be open. There's no reason to think it would not be open to nonprofits, but a competitive grant program to um, really encourage businesses to get involved in childcare. So Miranda spoke about this around how being tied to the private sector allows her to offer um, a, a different, different types of wages like that we really see that there is a significant space in Iowa for the private sector to step up, lean in, and um, work on innovative ways that both in expand child care availability in the state, but also um, have financial investment as, in well, as well. So we want um, to be part of um, encouraging businesses to lean into that. 
there are some toolkits out there for businesses who maybe are interested but don't quite know what, what are some opportunities for them. There's technical assistance to them. And there will be um, a big financial, um, as I said, competitive grant program about to be um, unveiled. So uh, pay attention to that if this is something that you think makes sense for you or um, companies you may work for. And there's so many ways for businesses to get involved. I mean, you granted Collins has an on-site child care center. You don't have to go that big and bold all at once. Um, but whether or not you can get a co-op of businesses, several small businesses to get together, but even to support a lot of our existing child care centers, not necessarily building a brand new one, but supporting the existing ones already here by even helping fund a classroom or, you know, an age group, or, I mean, there's so many different ways. And the Iowa Women's Foundation does have a business toolkit. And I know in Lynn County, we have a Lynn County Child Care Coalition that just started meeting back up. We started before the pandemic. Um, the breaks hit when the pandemic hit, um, but we're rebooting everything. And that's one of the things that we've been trying to talk about is just even in here in Lynn and some of our surrounding communities, trying to um, get business involved, but in different, there's such a variety of ways to do it. Um, yeah. So you don't have to have the big onsite, but there's ways that we can support our existing programs that are suffering and could use a little bit of a boost so we can open up more slots. There's a lot of spots. I know slots here, um, either in a home, pro in homes or even in centers, we just can't take our license capacity. We just don't have the staff to do it. So we have to limit our spots that are available. So there's just a lot of different ways that, um, the private sector can help. And, uh, Aaron, Aaron, I want to just mention, especially because I know that there's some questions coming in around rural areas. This is a space too, where we know the private sector and communities can also come together. Maybe it is not about a new building like Miranda's referencing. It's about offering third shift childcare, right? So we had heard during the child care task force, I remember distinctly hearing from somebody in the agricultural sector who worked in the with the poultry association going, hey, I need early morning workers and late night workers and trying to figure out how can child care be more fluid and adaptable so that those working parents can show up at five in the morning or maybe work till 11 p.m. at night. Those are, those are not only rural solutions, but those are, I definitely think of our more rural parts of the state. When I go, what is the needs of a community and how essential is that to come together and see what's possible? And when financial barriers are the thing that's making it impossible, come together now because there's gonna be some financial resources um, available very soon. Right. I think like Janae said, um, some of the challenges are community collaboration. And I think we need to be going to some of these rural communities, especially, and saying, what can we do for your community? How can your community come together with your school system, with your existing child care providers in home? Um, if you don't have child care providers in home, what does your community need to do? How, where are these families going to, to find child care? Um, in our community alone, I know we need to get together with our businesses and our school system, and we need to find a way to work together so that we can, not only with childcare, but with housing, with everything, it all, it all needs to come together and we need to have these conversations. Um, I know I had a friend that was, that was trying to open a private childcare, she, or a center, she had a private childcare, she was the only childcare provider in her community, in a rural community, and I, we talked about getting together with um, the mayor of her community and some of the businesses in the community and talking about what is the need. And she was working with child care resource and referral. I was very discouraged to find out that she she left that that anticipated area and opened a bar and a restaurant just because it was easier than going into child care. So um, we need to be addressing those community challenges and those community collaborations and finding ways to to help communities answer these questions. How do we get these workers, you know, to provide care for all of the, all of the families that we have that need care? I think one of the big things is we are always, and I think somebody mentioned it before, the infrastructure, you know, the childcare infrastructure. And I always look at it and the, I had somebody tell me, and I can't remember who it was, but I can still get to work if there is a bridge that needs to be repaired or if the bridge is closed, I can still get to work. I can find an alternative route. If my childcare center is closed or I don't have childcare, I cannot go to work. And so the kind of that importance of it, I think that's when we realized during the pandemic as well, but we are a community. We, 
we're there for the community and the state economy as well. So what we do is very important and it's necessary. So it's that infrastructure that we need to kind of help figure out. And I think even the shared services and things like Janae talked about helping to streamline some things and make life a little bit easier for us where we're not filling out the same paperwork and things as well. But it's just always sticks in my head that I can still get to work if a road is closed or if a bridge is closed, but I can't go to work if I don't have childcare. One more question I want to get to before we're done here. We're, we're just, just been such a um, great conversation here. Um, so Iowa has a free voluntary preschool for four-year-olds program um, statewide, um, but that program only operates a few hours out of the day. Um, I, I, are the panelists aware of creative ways um, some in-homes or childcare centers are kind of bridging that um, kind of having all day care, but utilizing those preschool programs? Um, and Janae and I just had this conversation yesterday. I'm sorry, Miranda. No, go ahead, Diane. Uh, Janae and I had this conversation yesterday about three-year-old funding. Um, there's been talk about three-year-old funding and I know our community is, I don't know if it's been passed, but they're utilizing, they're gonna go ahead and open a three-year-old program through the school system when we already have a three-year-old program that's offered in our community that's been operating for 67 years. And we need that collaboration with, with the existing programs. And I know we've got some child care, we've got some child care centers and some child care homes that are also providing preschool in their, in their programs. Um, if we take away from those and we already have challenges for these providers, we're taking away part of their income. And so we need to find ways to collaborate. What about transportation? I mean, is that something you guys are seeing offered where you're picking up kids from the two hour program and taking them to another place for the rest of the day? I think some programs do, we do not. Um, I do have a uh, statewide voluntary preschool in my building. Um, we offer a morning session, but parents have to drop off and pick up, but we do not offer wraparound because it takes a full-time slot away. Um, so that um, unfortunately affects my income as well. So I think it's hard when there's not transportation provided by the school districts because of funding reasons um, that, um, they don't, um, kids, parents have to drop off and pick up. I do have, and I know some, there's a comment, but, um, I do have in my half day program, a couple of, um, home providers that drop off and then come back and pick up the kiddo in, a, in after class. Um, and then she goes back to that home provider for the rest of the afternoon. So, um, so I know there's some home providers that do provide transportation. I think some of us centers kind of, we either, we don't provide transportation at all, or it makes it very difficult to access transportation for the, those families to be able to utilize both programs. I know we have, we provide transportation for our kiddos that are here in our building at the center down to the YMCA where we have a universal preschool four-year-old programs. And uh, the YMCA goes ahead and takes the cost of that. And we provide that, that transportation cost to get those kids to and from preschool. So our program does offer that as part of their program. But I know some, some home providers also utilize the, the transportation. And I know, I don't know if that cost is then passed on to the families I'm sure it probably is that they're responsible for paying that cost to get back and forth. I've often wondered about the services that some communities have for um, seniors, um, like a bus, the busing that might get seniors to doctor's appointments and things, whether that could also be used for children, you know, getting to and from childcare from preschool. But um, you know, we could probably have a whole nother hour or two to talk about this. And I guess that's what these different, um, uh, you know, vision sharing groups and committees at the state level are working on um, to shape what this is going to look like in the next year. And I'm really looking forward to coming back to this topic and, you know, calling Janae up and, you know, six months to a year and saying, okay, what, what's happened with these things that we talked about um, during Iowa Ideas Week? Um, so I want to just thank our panelists for being here today. We've had a, just a really fantastic conversation about this topic. And, uh, you know, just as a reminder to our listeners, our panelists today are Diana Williams, Director of the Ann Wickman Child Development Center, operated by the Nishna Valley 
Family YM YMCA in Atlantic, Miranda Nimi, Director of the Collins Aerospace Day Academy in Cedar Rapids, Janae Harvey, Division Administrator of Adult Children and Family Services for the Iowa Department of Human Services, and Re Representative Tracy Eller, a Cedar Rapids lawmaker and early childhood educator. So we'll be wrapping up the Iowa Ideas in-depth week um, Thursday and Friday um, with discussions on infrastructure and a panel Friday about strategy across geographic boundaries. And these discussions, including ours today, will all be available to watch online um, for folks who couldn't be here over the noon hour. So thanks again to our panelists and um, thanks to our listeners. Have a great afternoon.